Next speaker is uh, Aurélien Géron. He's an AI expert at KiwiSoft, which he founded. Uh, he's also author of uh, best-selling books uh, at O'Reilly about TensorFlow uh, and a former Google uh, video classification team. All right. Okay, just a show of hand. Uh, who here uses TensorFlow professionally or who hasn't? Yeah, uh, who has used it, I mean? All right, okay, so not everyone. I'll, I'll try to, to stay high level then. Uh, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Aurélien Geron. Uh, you already mentioned that I worked as uh, the lead of YouTube's uh, video classification team uh, in Paris, which means my job was to tag every video with you know, what it's about, which is mostly cats, of course, on YouTube. Um, and then I wrote this book, Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. Um, and the second edition is coming up. Anyway, today, the uh, talk is about TensorFlow 2, which you might have heard has uh, just not been released, but the alpha um, version has just been released. And I'll explain what's new um, and how you migrate from TensorFlow 1 to TensorFlow 2. Um, okay, so yeah, it was just announced, I think, 10 days ago or so uh, at the TensorFlow Dev Summit. And they announced the alpha version with a lot of improvements. Um, and the final release candidate is scheduled for Q2. 2019, whatever that means, I guess it's probably going to be like end of June, possibly, um, but we'll see. And why did they actually create TensorFlow 2? It's a major change, so it's going to impact a lot of people, um, and major changes will allow you to do a lot of cleanup and improvements, uh, even though they're breaking. And the, the, the reason, the motivation initially is this. These are the number of citations in machine learning papers. Uh, that's early 2018, so the graphs have changed. I, I should update them. Um, but you can see that TensorFlow is, you know, by far at the time the most cited uh, library in, in scientific papers. Um, you know, Cafe, Fiano, Torch were all kind of stagnating or going down. And then you have TensorFlow and Keras shooting up. But you also have this PyTorch going up. And a lot of the PyTorch users, you might have heard, are kind of migrating from TensorFlow 1 to PyTorch. And everybody says, you know, it's, it's much simpler. It's, it's really nice. And that's true. So uh, TensorFlow basically had to react. And, um, and the first improvement is on simplicity to make it much easier to use. So let's look at a little bit of PyTorch code. If you want to compute like one plus one half plus one quarter and so on, this is what it looks like. Um, it's very, very natural, um, you know, Python code. You can just create your tensor x, uh, y equals to one, then the saturation x equal x plus y and y equals y divided by two. And you know, run this 50 times and you converge to two. Fantastic, it's very natural. Now let's look at the equivalent code in TensorFlow 1. It would look like this. You would have the first phase, which is the construction phase, where you actually build a computation graph. No computation is actually executed here. It's just building a computation graph. And you, know, you, you, you create all the operations that you'll need to ma manipulate, plus this thing that says, you know, I will um, initialize all the variables. And this is where the actual computations start. You need to create a session, initialize all the variables, and then run your iteration where you, uh, you know, explicitly say, I want to execute this part of the graph and this part of the graph. So if you think of computation graphs or TensorFlow graphs as kind of a language, basically here you're writing a program in that language, and here you're executing that program. So it's kind of meta-programming. Um, and it has a lot of advantages, I'll, I'll get to it, but clearly, you know, for most simple work, you don't want to be coding like this. It's, it's, uh, it's a little bit too complicated and verbose. Um, the other thing is it, it can hide subtle bugs. Like for example, if I decide to execute add op and divide op uh, in one shot, well, TensorFlow is not, or TensorFlow 1 is not gonna see any dependencies between these two operations. As far as it's concerned, those are completely separate and independent, so it's happy to launch them in parallel, and therefore the order of execution is not guaranteed, and as you can see, the result is no, no, no longer two. In fact, if you execute this code multiple times, you'll get different results every time. Um, and that's kind of hard to catch. It's not super frequent, but it does happen, or it did happen in TensorFlow 1. It's fixed in two, as I'll, I'll explain. Um, and the other thing is it's a little bit hard to debug. Say you have x and y is a function of x and z is a function of y. Well, if you uh, execute z and you, you get a value that's actually not a number, well, you're kind of stuck. Why do I get a NAND value here? If you could debug, you might end up saying, oh wait, I'm dividing by zero over there, that's the reason. But as far as you know, Python is concerned, this is just a function call that directly gets executed in C++, it doesn't see the details, so in the stack trace, all you get is 
boom, there's an exception on this line. I don't know any, you know, any more of that. In TensorFlow 1, there actually is a graph debugger, but not, but not, you know, not many people use it, and it's a little bit tricky to use. Uh, the other thing that's harder is to profile for the same reason. Like if I try to execute a time it on uh, you know, running z the z here, um, I'll get some number that's you know, how, how fast it runs, but I won't actually have the detail in terms of you know, this operation, that operation, that operation. Which one runs faster? It's not clear. Um, for the exactly the same reason. And again, there are tools that were developed that allow you to you know, profile graphs, but again, not many people use them and it's not very natural. Um, so the solution came in TensorFlow 1.4. Uh, so it's not TensorFlow 2, this actually, the solution came way earlier. It's called uh, eager execution. When you start your TensorFlow program, you just activate it and you know, magically, from now, it's not in graph mode anymore. So any operation you execute actually gets run right away and you get the answer right away. So as you can see, it's almost the same code as in PyTorch, right? Uh, there's this extra line. But this line actually disappears because in TensorFlow 2, eager mode is the default. So when you look at a you know, TensorFlow 2 program or a PyTorch program, um, they can look very, very similar. Uh, this last thing here is because these are tensors, if you want to see the value without having a long uh, you know, line here, you can just call NumPy, it gives you the actual value. All right, so now that we've seen that basically eager execution is much, much simpler to use, you might wonder why did we use graph mode in the first place? Uh, why would you want to use it? And the first reason I've hinted to uh, earlier, if you do b equals a plus three and c equals a times five, in graph mode, this will lead to a graph that looks somewhat like this, actually exactly like this. Um, and it's easy to see when you look at this graph that this addition operation, this multiplication operation are completely independent and they can be run in parallel. And that's the first thing you gain from you know, having a computation graph is that TensorFlow can actually run automatically things in parallel without you having to manipulate any threads or anything. It, it parallelizes everything for you. Um, so if you have multiple cores, you know, different operations will not run actually in different cores. Uh, the second benefit is that if you actually express everything in a graph, that graph can actually be run entirely on an accelerator like a GPU or a TPU. Um, and without all the back and forth with Python, you know, with the CPU, I mean. Um, and this can speed things up a lot. If you're, if you, you know, if you're manipulating operations of huge matrices, um, then it might not make a big difference because the, uh, the overhead of going back to, to Python might not be that huge. But if you have lots of lots and lots of smaller operations that need to run really fast, um, this can make a big difference. Um, another benefit of graphs is that since you have this kind of representation of all your computations, um, TensorFlow can actually analyze the graph and possibly optimize it. So of course, like getting rid of, of uh, nodes that you don't use, um, or s in the case of XLA, it can do things like find um, pairs of operations um, that, you know, for which an actual optimized implementation exists. And it will swap out the pair of operations and replace it with the optimized version. Okay, so it can speed things up that way. So that's a benefit of having something symbolic that you can play with. Um, and another benefit, and I guess to me this is like one of the uh, biggest advantages of TensorFlow over the competition, it's the portability. Um, you, you take a TensorFlow graph and you can just run it on a mobile device. Uh, you can run it in a web browser. I invite you, if you haven't seen it already, to go to tensorflow.org slash js slash demos. Uh, you'll see TensorFlow.js directly run in the browser. Here I played this little game and the neural net was actually trained in the, uh, the browser but you don't have to train in the browser. You can train it in Python, export the graph, and then run it in your browser. So portability is also one key element of um, having graphs. And then, you know, of course, you can run the same graph on your servers and, and go to production, and, and, all the, and this will be the same graph running in all these environments. Okay, so the good news is in TensorFlow 2, you can actually have the best of bo both worlds. By default, everything is eager, meaning you know, every time I execute a TensorFlow operation, I get the result right away, so it's easy to debug, it's easy to profile, it's natural to code. Um, but if I want to speed up this little function here, I can do that very simply. Just add this decorator at tf.function, and that's about it. Um, w everything will happen under the hood. This function will now be a, a graph function, if you will. Uh, so the way it works is the first time you actually call this function um, with actual values like two and three, well, the function, the Python function will be traced. 
And by tracing, I mean it's actually going to be executed, but not with the values two and three. Instead, it's going to be called with so-called symbolic tensors, which if you know TensorFlow 1, you can think of as placeholders. Okay, so it's basically calling this function that you wrote with this thing here that says, I'm a tensor, I'm a scalar, there's no shape, like shape is empty, and it's a float 32, um, and, and then the operations don't actually compute anything, they build a graph, right? So this will be run in graph mode, um, and once the function is traced, well, you have this nice little graph in memory that's cached in this TensorFlow function, so the next time that you call the same function with different you know, scalar values, different floats, it'll reuse the same graph. Of course, it won't create it every time. And so you can get you know, very, a lot of speed up with this. Um, so the graph might look something like this, with x and y being placeholders. If you, you can actually still go and look at the graph that was generated, and those would be actual placeholders in the graph. Okay? Uh, but you don't need to handle them yourself. You don't need to feed anything. Basically, you don't need to manipulate graphs, sessions, placeholders. All of these are handled automatically now. So right, you get the power of um, graphs with the ease of uh, programming and all the benefits of eager execution. Okay, so you can mix and match eager and graph modes. So for example here, this I'm coming back to the one plus one half plus one quarter thing, um, and you can see that this is the, the whole code, and I've decided for some reason that I just want to speed up this little piece here. Uh, and this, this is the graph function, or the TensorFlow function as they're called, um, but I have this external loop, and it just calls this um, on and on and on, and I get the right result. Um, by the way, the problem that I mentioned earlier that it, it, the addition and division operation might run in parallel and you don't know which one will run first, that has been fixed in TensorFlow 2. Anything that affects the state uh, or a stateful uh, object, such as a variable, will actually automatically be run in the right order by the graph. Okay, so uh, TensorFlow ensures that this will be run first and this will be run second. It won't try to paralyze them. This is fixed. Um, okay, now. Also notice that I didn't need to create like a global uh, variables initializer. Um, I, I just create a variable and it's completely natural. It's like object oriented. This is where the state is. It's nowhere else. Um, there's no like default graph or default session or anything. Everything is uh, linked to a Python object. And so it's pretty natural. Don't need to handle the control dependencies. I mentioned that already. Now look at this loop here. I have this for loop that's outside of the TensorFlow function, so it's just running uh, on and on and on and calling my TensorFlow function, but I actually, actually put it inside another TensorFlow function if I wanted to. You can do that, um, and this loop here will actually run in the graph. It's not gonna run during tracing time, at tracing time, um, because of some magic called autograph. What TensorFlow does is it captures the source code of this function here, analyzes it, and notices, hey, I'm actually calling tf.range and not range, okay? And since I'm calling tf.range here, um, this means that this should actually be ported to the graph itself. So during tracing, it'll just skip this, and this loop will be executed when you, when you execute the graph itself, all right? So it makes it very easy to write like dynamic models, um, like RNNs and things like that, uh, using this kind of code. Um, I could actually remove the tf function decoration up there, because here I'm calling this function, run loop. It's a tf function, and it depends on run step, so it's actually recursive. Um, when this function gets called and it tries to you know, turn this into a graph, it's gonna see, wait, it depends on this function, and it's gonna turn this into a graph, and so on. So it's recursive. You don't need to sprinkle tf function everywhere. You can basically put it at your entry points, uh, like your main functions. Um, everything good so far, right? Yes? Right, good question. So, so if you have, like, if you actually want to port your code and, and impl install it in, like, a, you know, ported to, to a web browser and so on, it needs to be exported to a format called save model. And, of course, this only supports TensorFlow operations, right? It doesn't support, like, arbit arbitrary Python code. If, if it did, I mean, you'd, you'd need to have, like, a Python environment in the mobile device or so on. So you need to, to basically, in order for it to be portable, you need to export it to a saved model, and this only accepts TensorFlow functions. So uh, you would have to basically convert everything to TF functions in order to be able to export it. But usually what, here I'm showing, like, the low-level API. Usually what you'll use is, is um, tf.keras. Uh, Keras is uh, the, you know, you, 
you all know Keras, but I think people think of Keras as a library uh, because it started out that way, but now it's more like an API, and there are several implementations of the Keras API, one of which is the original and reference implementation, also called Keras. I call it Keras Team, so there's no confusion. Um, and, and this implementation is actually less used than the, the um, Keras implementation inside TensorFlow, which is called tf.keras. Uh, and usually you, you would use tf.keras for most of your work. Like you, it's so flexible now that you don't really very often need to go to that level unless you're really customizing things. And at the Keras level, it compiles everything for you. So you need to, 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 to make sure if you just use standard layers, everything will be okay. If you write your own custom layers, they need to use only you know, TensorFlow functions if you want to be, for it to be portable. Does that answer your question? Uh, the eager mode is basically in a sequential fashion, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when we are moving to graph mode, just changing um, the add to TF function, yeah. um, will it still uh, be good or we have to do one more level of debugging to make sure all my um, uh, see, um, the executions are happening in order and all those things? Right, right. So, so uh, usually, uh, for I run a bunch of tests, right? Uh, and uh, usually you always always get the same result, but in this particular example, for example, since I'm running a loop with tf.range, this will actually complain in eager mode. So what you would do is when you're testing or debug, you're, you're programming, you would run, you, you'd have this as range, right? Uh, and then once you're happy and it passes all your tests and you'd add tf.range and that's where it would be ported to the graph, right? So I, I can't say that it's 100% automatic and it's guaranteed to give you the same result, but usually you'd be programming in completely in eager mode and then at the end trying to transition to, to um, tf functions and normally a lot of the constructs are just taking into account uh, just add tf and you're good. Like if you have print statements, replace them with tf.print and it'll work as well. If you have asserts, you replace them with tf.assert, okay? Um, so yeah, so this will actually put the loop itself in the graph. If you have range of n, then it would actually run when tracing the function and so you'd end up with a graph that actually calls the, the, the function 50 times, for example, right? So make sure you call tf.range if you actually want the loop to be in the graph. Um, all right, so the control flow that autograph automatically um, uh, handles is things like if statements, this also ends up in the graph, all right? So it's captured and, and ends up in the graph. Um, return statements are handled gracefully uh, in the graph as well. Uh, you have loops with for loops. You also have you know break and while and tf.print and tf.assert. Autograph captures a lot of the very you know the most common constructs uh, for control flow. And if you just use tf operations plus these simple control flows, if you just call functions uh, that you wrote yourself, you're good to go. If you call like an external library or even the Python standard library then it probably won't work because it's call not calling TensorFlow operations, right? Um, so, so that's it, yeah. The, so the simplicity of you know, eager mode and graph mode, is, is, that makes a huge difference with TensorFlow 2. I, if you run away from TensorFlow 1 because of the complexity, try it again with TensorFlow 2 and I, I'm sure you'll love it, uh, as I do. The, the second improvement is that it's much more Pythonic. Um, like one of the problems with TensorFlow 1, it was that a lot of things were kind of name-based using global scopes and things like that, and this has been improved tremendously. So one example is you know, sharing weights across layers. Typically in a Siamese networks, you'd have some architecture like this where these two layers are sharing weights. And in TensorFlow 1, you'd, you'd implement this somehow like this, where you'd have these two layers here, and uh, if you look closely, they have the same name. And that's how you would share weights between layers. It was name-based. That's kind of brittle. It's easy to break this if you have multiple libraries creating different pieces of the graph and by a chance they actually happen to use the same name, you're out of luck. If you could use name scope, that was a whole mess in itself. Notice the second one says reuse equals true. That's how you would share we uh, weights in TensorFlow 1. Now in TensorFlow 2, it's, uh, yeah, so you'd use you know, variable scopes and get variable and a lot of constructs actually came from the fact that it was this logic of being based with on names. So instead in, in TensorFlow 2, uh, what you do is you actually create like, Keras layers like this. If you used Keras before, this is very natural Keras code, um, and except we import it from TensorFlow because we're using tf.keras. This is not you know, the, the uh, pip install Keras thing. This is the Keras that comes with TensorFlow. All right? You don't need to install anything else. Um, well, I create one layer here, and then I call it twice with two different inputs, and that's how I share weights. It's, it's very object-oriented and natural. 
okay. Um, everybody get this? Yeah. So that's one thing. Another thing is where in TensorFlow 1, there was some global state that was used. Like you create an optimizer, and then you say, I want to minimize this loss. Well, you want to minimize the loss by tweaking some variables, but I'm not telling you which variables to tweak here. So how does it know? Well, it knew because actually it would call, you know, internally it would call tf.trainable variables. It's as if you had called it like this. And tf trainable variables would actually look up a default graph, and in there it would look up a collection of variables, and so it assumes that people had inserted stuff in there. It's like using global scope. It's not very clean. Um, instead, it, you know, it's like global to the graph. It's the same kind of problem in, in, in the way this was thought out, using global and um, global scope and names. Um, so yeah, it assumes one model per graph. It's only available actually in graph mode. So you don't, yeah, collections basically in TensorFlow 2 are dead. They're removed. Variable scopes don't exist anymore. All this like uh, mess with names and so on that's, and global scope that's gone. So instead what you do is you create a Keras layer like this, a uh, model like this, and each layer actually handles its own weights, right? It's, there's no like other object where we're sending the variables to. No, it's, it's like this component where, which owns the variables itself. And since this model contains several layers, if you ask the model itself what are the weights of the model, it recursively asks each layer and it gives you the whole list of uh, weights for the whole model. And it's kind of clean, right? It's uh, just in one place and you don't need this global thing. Um, and so now when you, when you call the optimizer's minimize method, well, you can pass very easily all the variables that you want to, uh, to minimize. So this, the changes are variable scope is removed, um, get variable is removed, you know, um, minimize now requires you to pass in some variables, but it's actually easy if you've wrapped them in layers, in Keras layers. Um, yeah, and that leads me to the next point. It's uh, everything has been uh, cleaned up a lot. Another complaint that people had about TensorFlow 1 is that it is starting to be very cluttered with a lot of stuff. Um, duplicated APIs and a lot of you know, unused things are, uh, in tf.contrib. So like one example of duplication is tf.layers and tf.keras.layers. Well, that's gone. Now everything is, uh, is high level and it's in the official, you know, the official high level API for TensorFlow 2 is Keras. So everything's in there. And there's no duplication here. tf.contrib, this is like a snapshot of what tf.contrib contains in TensorFlow 1. Um, and in there you have a lot of things that um, haven't just never been used. Like if you search on uh, GitHub, you won't actually find anybody using them or, or you know, almost nothing. Uh, others are just not maintained anymore. Some have actually already ported, been ported to core API, but they're still there. So it's, it was becoming a big mess uh, and a maintenance nightmare. So they just decided to completely remove it. Uh, there's this, um, there will be no TF contrib anymore where, where anybody can just push some code in. That just won't happen. Um, and the important parts of those have already been moved to TensorFlow 2 core API. And the other ones that were less important or less used, some of them have been moved to um, the add-ons. We have the, uh, one of GDDs here, Jason, who, uh, who handles that, or uh, one of the SIGs that, that's around this. And um, uh, oh, a special inter interest group is what I just said, SIG. And uh, yeah, and so this get removed, and some of them are just not used, and so they're, they're, they disappeared. All right. Um, the API has been cleaned up as well. Like there were lots of, a lot and a lot of things just at the root um, name, name scope. Um, and so now a lot of packages have been created. So instead of, you know, uh, tf.assert, uh, well, tf.assert actually is the wrong example, but uh, a lot of things have been moved into sub packages. So it cleans everything up. And there are some aliases for the most commonly used functions like tf.exp for exponential. Uh, the actual function is tf.math.exponential, but it's so used that they, they kept the alias in tf.x. But overall, it's really very cleaned up. And a migration tool has been provided. That's where you know, you, you, you'd, you're pretty happy at this point. You're like, oh, this is too much change. Well, uh, there's a migration tool. And so my last point will be about migration. I'm almost out of time. Um, my recommendation would be if you have a TensorFlow 1 code base that exists today, try to migrate it first to, to Keras as much as you can. A lot of the functionalities uh, that are available in TensorFlow 2 with Keras just work the same way in TensorFlow 1. So if you can migrate as much as you can to Keras, the transition will be much easier. The second thing is anywhere you're using tf.contrib, well, try to migrate to something else because tf.contrib is just out of the picture in TensorFlow 2. All right, so no migration possible if you're using tf.contrib. Um, and lastly, this is how you use the upgrade uh, tool. You just give the 
in the directory of your source code and the directory of the output, and it just converts it. So mostly, it will actually just rename things and put them in tf.compat.v1. Uh, they have this compatibility module where basically all of TensorFlow 1 is still supported except for tf.contrib um, inside this package. Of course, it doesn't give you nice and canonical code, uh, but it allows you to have production code still work in TensorFlow 2 using this. Um, now, some, some things like tf.losses.logloss uh, actually has a, a perfectly good function in tf.keras, but it's not migrated to the keras version because it doesn't exactly do the same thing. Uh, like, there's subtle differences, so they're being very conservative and just pointing you to the compat v1 function. So, in some cases, you might have to, you know, check that you're not impacted by those little differences and then migrate to the appropriate uh, function. And you know, random uniformed now is underscore uniform is like random dot uniform. Like it does some of these things pretty nicely for you. It also takes care of all of the function arguments if the order has changed or the names have changed. Um, so yeah, it does this. There's a nice tool you want you can try, which is called oops uh, tf2 um, up dot ml, um, which you just give it like a, a Jupyter notebook or, or online. Uh, if if you have a GitHub repo like, like I do with some notebooks. You just change the URL and set up github.com. You replace that with tf2.up.ml. Uh, the same, the rest of the URL is the same. It'll automatically convert it. You can download the upgraded file, and you'll see, you know, all the diff and everything. Um, and lastly, and I'll, it's, I'm just out of time now. Lastly, it's actually um, TensorFlow was already open source, but I feel that the mentality uh, of the TensorFlow uh, team has opened up with TensorFlow 2. Um, and like, for example, there's this um, community project where anyone can submit RFCs, a request for comments, and, and proposals for how, what TensorFlow 2 should be. And this has run for uh, since uh, last August uh, and worked pretty well. There were lots of, of um, uh, proposals like, like these, um, and people contributed this way. So I think in the spirit of this conference, uh, the, 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 it was already open source, but I think it's even more open now. Um, you can you know, go to these discussion groups or developer groups if you want uh, more details. Um, so yeah, I think to conclude, it's cleaner, more object-oriented, Pythonic, you get the, you know, the ease of use of, of um, eager execution, the power of graph mode, um, which gives you, you know, speed and portability. You have like super rich APIs to handle, uh, uh, you know, I, sh I didn't talk much about Keras, uh, but you know, super beautiful API that you can use, a data API for efficient loading and everything. This was already in TensorFlow 1, so that's why I didn't cover it now. The great API, huge community, like a m most used uh, framework out there in machine learning. Uh, documentation has improved a lot, and many projects have been built on top of it. You also get like TPUs on the cloud, which right now is, um, this is the only library that can actually benefit from TPUs. PyTorch is actually coming uh, soon on this. And it's even more open. So if you want to play with this, I have some um, uh, Jupyter notebooks that are open source on my GitHub account, uh, slash Adrian. There's a whole TF2 course with exercises if you want to go to this. And I'm writing the second edition of my book. This was the notebooks for the first edition. And the second edition is, uh, is, is here, so I'm like at chapter 13 or so. And it goes into all the details. You can try that out. And with that, I think that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, let me repeat that again. So were there any changes with respects to uh, in the uh, input of data and the output of data, specifically with respects to uh, turning that into a uh, online prediction, uh, the online prediction components? Yes, that's an excellent question. So the, uh, one of the difficulty people had with TensorFlow 1 is, okay, sure, I can, I can train a model locally, but how do I deploy it to production? And uh, in different environments, how do I train it on multiple um, machines and, and so on? And how do I um, you know, prepare the data and, and, and everything? So uh, this is one of the announcements that, that came with, um, with the TensorFlow 2, uh, TensorFlow 2 Dev Summit, um, was there's this platform called TFX, TensorFlow Extended, um, which includes several projects that are not included in, in TensorFlow, but you can download them on the, on the side, um, and they all help to productionize TensorFlow models. So you have, for example, TensorFlow uh, Transform, or TF Transform, which allows you to write pre-processing code once, and you can run this code, in, it's written in Python, you can run it in batch mode over all your, your training data, and it'll just convert it using Apache Beam um, into you know, your pre-processed data set, and then you can train your model on that. And then it also generates a TensorFlow graph, 
that you can um, put in your model once it's trained. You just plug it in and put that in production. And so it will be able to also pre-process using the same function, it'll pre-process uh, incoming data on the fly as well. Um, so it, it includes, TFX includes also TF serving, which is like a, a very um, powerful server. That's what they use internally at Google uh, to serve multiple models. It handles multiple versions. If you switch from one version to the other, it works fine. It actually supports having multiple models at the same time if you're doing experiments, for example. Um, so fantastic platform. There's also things like model validation, another module, TensorFlow validation, um, and I'm missing a, a few, but to check out TFX, um, and this is like the way to productionize TensorFlow models, and they, they just released, they, they had already <laughs> released some components last year, but now you have the whole, um, the whole framework. Yep. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, still related on the deployment uh, model, um, are there plans or uh, is there an initiative already for like uh, TensorFlow to support Onyx or is it like TFX is the only way to go? Uh, right now, uh, I don't think there's, in, I, I, I'm sure there's no Onyx. Uh, I don't think it's even in the roadmap. Um, or, so that's a good question, like why, why they're not using Onyx. I, one of the feedback I got is that uh, Onyx is kind of a talking point right now on the, the, the argument is who actually in this room uses <laughs> Onyx to deploy, uh, it's not that use is, is, the, is the point. And so investing some efforts on that doesn't seem productive for the TensorFlow team. That's, I, I'm, I'm speaking for them, so, so take, you know, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's the logic, but that's what my feeling is. Any other questions? But in terms of portability, if you think of Onyx as a way to save your model in a kind of portable way across multiple platforms, uh, TensorFlow actually includes Keras, right? And you can, if you want to have portability across frameworks, you can save your, your Keras model using Keras format, right? And once you do that, you can actually take that model and run it on any Keras implementation. And this also includes like CNTK, this includes you know, all, all other uh, Theano and other libraries. It doesn't include PyTorch, which doesn't have a, a Keras implementation. So in terms of portability, even at the model level, it's arguable, you know, arguably uh, the, the portability thanks to Keras is higher. But um, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's debatable. Yeah, yeah, I, I, oh, but you can. Uh, Keras allows you to save a trained model with all the weights and everything, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, try, try it out. Um, now, obviously, I'd be happy if they had Onyx support, right? And they, but um, right now, I don't think it's planned. Well, thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. Yeah.